and I thought it was more important to get Amtrak practical and serving as much of the country as it could. And so I turn it over to Mr. Practical about Amtrak for many years. Good afternoon. I'm always a little nervous when I get a nice introduction because I view my role as being that of the skunk at the picnic for real passenger <laughs> development. I'm going to talk to you today about growth and networks <clears throat> and how networks drive growth. They create growth almost out of thin air. <clears throat> Amtrak's national market share for intercity passenger transport is less than motorcycles. Just think about that. Amtrak in its entirety produces fewer annual passenger miles than motorcycles do in this country. And you can say, on one hand, you can say, well, you know, that's not very good after what we've spent on it. But the fact is that market share is, is it's, it's worse than that because it's shrinking year over year. Our population is growing, mobility is growing, travel is growing, and Amtrak's share of that total is shrinking. It's small, it's, it's trivially small and getting worse. But the good news, the, the, kind of the opposite side of that coin, is it's all upside for real passenger service. And it's, it's like falling off a log easy to envision ways to grow that system to where, it's be, where it becomes socially relevant. And where the senator and where John were talking about, you know, people want to get places and increasingly, I mean, I don't see any young faces in this room, but the 20s, the 30s, even the 40s, they really are more inclined to look for public transportation options, and they're less inclined to just uh, routinely think of their private car as the only way to get someplace. So the question in my mind is, where and how do we grow rail passenger service in ways that make sense? Uh, sometimes uh, growth occurs as a result of sheer political power. People who have got the money say, this is where I want more service, so that's where the money goes. Uh, and sometimes growth occurs because when the people who have the money are making decisions, they, they look at a path of least resistance. This project we can get done, that project makes a lot more sense, but we can't get it done. So we'll do this one first. That happened in Minnesota with our light rail system in the Twin Cities. Hiawatha Corridor was not the first choice by any measure, but it was the path of least resistance. It was a way to get the ball rolling, to break that log jam on light rail. And today, you know, 25 years later, we're finally starting to get a network built that's going to be very, very productive when it, when it shows up. So what, what I want to ex uh, explore with you is places where we can drive growth in, in intercity rail passenger service. I'm talking about this from a national perspective, but the principles apply on a regional basis just as well. Uh, in terms of where is it possible, where can we do it at the least cost, and where can we get the greatest return on investment? And I'm going to come back to the ROI issue over and over again because getting a return on investment, even in a public sector program, I think is critical. If, if you're running a sewer board, let's say, you want to get the most gallonage or whatever they measure per dollar spent. You got a budget, you got to get the biggest bang for the buck. Uh, if you're running the library system, you want the most book nights lent out or whatever, again, whatever their metric is per dollar spent so that you get the most bang for the, for the resources that are available to you. What you see when you look at, and I'm, I'm going to explain this as I go through this, when you look at the FRA slash Amtrak slash MIPRC maps, and isn't it curious that it's all the same map? They're not colluding with each other, are they? <clears throat> Those maps reflect a development scheme that minimizes the return on investment. Those are schemes that will develop the fewest incremental annual revenue passenger miles per dollar spent. It's politically driven, not rationally economically driven. And what it is, uh, from the point of view of Amtrak, which is heavily influencing this process, is it's, it's the latest version, the latest iteration. How many of you remember the emerging corridors mantra from 1973? 
I see a few hands. You remember when the United Aircraft Turbo Train did the national tour in 73 to promote emerging corridors? Always the next big thing. Well, it's still going on. That, that's all that you're seeing in those maps. So what I would argue is that if the goal, and I, I think it should be, if the goal is to maximize the number of annual RPMs per dollar invested, that's how you get the most growth with the resources that you've got available, you have to recognize a couple of just very basic building blocks. One is that uh, frequencies of rail service have to be inversely proportional to distance. In, in the shorter markets, you need more frequencies to compete against private cars and to provide a socially meaningful service. Urban transit, you're not going to do that with a bus every two hours. You've got to have a bus every 10 minutes or 15 minutes to, to be worth doing it at all. In transcontinental markets, 2,000 mile markets, uh, once a day, you know, that you can do things with once a day in that market because the distance is so great and the character of the travel that it, it, uh, that it supports uh, is, is amenable to that. But with greater frequencies, you guys are seeing this in the Chicago-Milwaukee corridor, with greater frequencies, it's a step function, you reach thresholds where to handle the number of frequencies that you have to do to provide a meaningful contribution in any given corridor requires infrastructure. You can't run seven round trips a day on a single track railroad. California figured that out. It's not a big surprise. We saw that coming 40 years ago. And so the, the LA San Diego corridor in painfully slow bits and pieces is being double tracked. In Chicago, Milwaukee, you've already got double track. But in order to get the, the level of frequencies you need to compete with the interstate in that market, you need to enhance that railroad. And that's what Aaron Rao is doing. Uh, and doing it very, uh, I think, thoughtfully. But infrastructure, as, you, as we all know, rail infrastructure is amazingly expensive. So in shorter markets, to provide the frequencies that you have to have, you got to spend really big bucks to get there. And the result, at the end of the day, is you get relatively few revenue passenger miles out of it. So you've spent a lot to get very little. Here's a proof of that concept. In the sacred cow, the Amtrak system in the Northeast Corridor, which costs somewhere close to $2 billion a year of public subsidy, buses have a greater market share. And Amtrak's market share in the Northeast Corridor has shrunk over the years. The number of annual passenger miles produced in the Northeast Corridor is about two-thirds of the annual passenger miles produced by the national system of interregional long distance trains. So you spend a fortune and you don't get very much to show for it. And that's, that's just, you know, it's political power, I get that. But that's not smart investment strategy. In order to be effective in a short, you know, three trains a day to Detroit is ridiculous. That's hardly worth, worth the effort. If you're going to compete in those markets, it takes big bucks. Lots of money, very little to show for it, even in a full, full application. So my challenge to you and to people doing this is, what if we inverted that? What if we said, how can we spend less and get more, rather than spending more and getting less? You, you all know, you, know, you guys have heard me speak before. You've seen, I'm sure you've seen some of my writing. The interregional trains, the, the national system long distance trains, already today, as capital starved as they are, it, uh, represent Amtrak's largest and most successful and most undercapitalized market segment by all of the objective measures that you use to measure any transportation enterprise. Passenger miles, market share, load factors, uh, even intercity ridership. The national uh, interregional trains carry as many uh, intercity passengers as do the Amtrak trains in the Northeast Corridor. When you see Northeast Corridor ridership numbers that Amtrak always likes to tout, you gotta remember, three quarters of those riders aren't intercity, they're commuter in terms of their statistical classification. They're people, they pay money, and they ride the trains. All that's good, but they're commuter riders, they're not really intercity, which is what Amtrak was chartered to go after. And the load factor on the different trains turns out to be the most important single element 
I didn't think that was that funny. It's a baby shower next door. Okay. Uh, yeah. Getting, getting good reactions. I haven't even told a joke yet. The load um, factor turns out to be the most, most important single element to suggest where new capital might best be invested. And the reason is very simple. In markets where the capacity that you're providing consistently exceeds the demand for service, you're overcapitalized. You're, you're building more inventory than you can sell. And that's true in the Northeast Corridor. It's true in, in most of the uh, state-supported regional corridors. That the, just look at the Amtrak published load factors for those trains. The NEC hovers around 50%. Some years it's a little bit more than that. Other years it's a little bit less. Year, year in, year out, it's about 50%. And that tells you that half of the available seat miles that Amtrak produces at very great cost are going unsold. They can't give them away. They, they run BOGO sales and they still can't fill those trains up. And the same thing is true of an awful lot of the state supported regional quarters. Long distance trains demand over the course of a year, I'm not talking about weekdays in March, but over the course of a year demand consistently exceeds capacity. The load factors on the national system interregional trains run it varies route by road, route, of course. They run in the 55 to 65 percent range. And with a long distance train, two thirds full at any given point is sold out because of the large number of towns served by the, or stations served by the train. A seat that's empty here has already been sold to somebody who's boarding down line. So it's really not realistically available for sale. Train's full at a two-thirds load factor. And we're running, we're bumping up against that. And this year, even though traffic in the interregional trains has surged back, I took a group of uh, people out to visit Glacier National Park this past summer. The Empire Builder was full. Sleeping cars completely full, coaches mostly full. Um, traffic is there. And you know what Amtrak's response to that has been? They've capped capacity on the trains. I don't understand that. The only thing that I've heard them say to explain that is, well, we can't hire enough people to staff the trains. I, I don't buy that explanation. I mean, it might be true in a shallow sense, but it's a stupid answer. Because you've got people trying to hand you money to ride your train, to buy your product, and you won't accommodate them because you can't hire people? That's crazy. So in the, in the interregional markets where demand consistently exceeds capacity, those markets are undercapitalized. We're not building enough inventory to sell to people. There's more demand than there is product to buy. So if we want to grow the, the, the system, we need to put new capital into the markets that are undercapitalized. If you've already, if you've got a market where you already can't sell half of what you're producing, expanding that just doesn't make any sense. Why would you do that? If you, had a, if you had a restaurant that was only selling half of what it was capable of selling, you wouldn't build a second one. Okay, so let's, let's talk for a second about the kinds of growth that are available. There's, there's two basic kinds of growth in business. One is called organic growth, and one is called scale growth. <clears throat> and let me use uh, a fast food chain as a metaphor to explain this. If you, if you run a group of quick service restaurants uh, and you want to grow the business, you've got two ways to do that. One is to build more units, build more stores. The other way is to squeeze more annual sales out of the stores you've got. Building more units is scale growth. Squeezing more annual sales out of the facilities you've already got is organic growth. Generally speaking, I, I know I'm oversimplifying this, but generally speaking, if you can squeeze more sales out of your existing units, you're going to get a much better return on investment. Your banker likes that, your shareholders like that, you should like that as a manager. You've got money in the ground, you want to get more sales out of what you've already invested. What if your existing units are underperforming? They're not, they're not meeting the sales goals that you've set for them. Why would you build more losers? That just doesn't make any sense. In Amtrak's case, why do you take your smallest and weakest business segment, objectively, by the numbers they publish, and do more of that and ignore your biggest and strongest segment? That's just, that's insane. 
That's putting things exactly backwards. Amtrak's plan seeks scale growth in their smallest, weakest business. But if your goal instead is, the, is to get the highest ratio of new annual revenue passenger miles per dollar spent, what you should be looking to is organic growth. Let's, let's sell the seats we're already running in the areas that are most undercapitalized in a regional service and where the demand most exceeds the capacity. That's just, I mean, to me, that's just screamingly obvious that that's where new capital should go. Not into these discontiguous, short, new city to city corridors. That's the worst possible way to drive return on investment in rail passenger. This is kind of a head slap, duh, obvious thing. The first thing you got to do is focus on selling the available seat miles you're producing or scaling back so that your capacity and your costs better match the actual demand for the service in the marketplace. The next thing you would do is add capacity to your sold out trains, put more coaches and put more sleeping cars onto trains like the Empire Builder, even if, God forbid, you have to put another guy in the dining car to service that business. And, that, and yet, that's what Amtrak will tell you. Well, we can't put another sleeper on the Empire Builder because it'll run up our losses because we'll have to put more staff in the dining okay. car. Okay, that's the, to me, that's the, the basic principle of driving growth is to seek out the greatest return on investment, new, new annual passenger miles per dollar invested, and look to the markets where that's possible, not to the markets where it's not happening and probably never will happen. How do you drive growth in the system once you accept that basic principle? It requires a grasp of the synergisms of networks rather than point-to-point -point discontiguous routes. And what you heard before the lunch break about the regional plan being put out by the FRA, they're making exactly the same fundamental conceptual error that they made 50 years ago in setting up the original Amtrak route system of looking to point-to-point -point city pairs rather than looking at building an integrated network. We've spent uh, in, in adjusted 21, 2021 constant dollars well over a hundred billion dollars on Amtrak in the last 45 years since, since 1975. And we've got this trivial market, national market share and a, a system that doesn't really have social relevance on a national scale. The output of a network, and this is true of all networks, the output of a network is a function of the number, in, in transportation terms, of the number of origin destination city pairs that are realistically accessible through the network. Let me say that again, because this is a real critical foundation block. The, function, the, the output of a network is a function of the number of usable OD pairs accessible in the network. Examples, air hubs, Delta at Atlanta. <clears throat> the number of OD pairs that are accessible through that hub at Atlanta or at Minneapolis, St. Paul or whatever uh, is much larger. It's, it's orders of magnitude larger than if Delta tried to serve every city in its network with point-to-point -point service. Uh, urban freeway systems. Think about Milwaukee, think about the Twin Cities. Uh, if you built a little bit of freeway here, and a little bit of freeway there, and a little one over here, and, and that's, that was your freeway system, using the word loosely, it would get some traffic. You know, some people would drive on it. But it's not until you take those little segments, you know, it might be three miles here and 10 miles there. If you tie those together into an urban network, what happens? you're inundated with traffic. And the population didn't suddenly just double. What you've done is concentrate traffic flows into the network. So you've got a huge output with a relatively modest cost of interlinking the, the segments, the components of that network. Same thing's true with telephone systems. The same thing is true with the internet. You have a few users, you get a little traffic. You get a lot of users and you get swamped with traffic. Origin destination pairs, <clears throat> therefore, is a proxy for output. It's an indirect way of saying that's the output of the system. Right. I'm sorry for the interruption here.
throw this chart, and this is not a business plan, this isn't high science, this is just to illustrate the concept of the network, and I'm going to use a really good map. It's real simple, don't be intimidated, but it shows you why Amtrak is coming after us exactly wrong. This graph is going to represent a single route, point-to-point -point route, and let's say it's got five stops. Now let's call those A, B, C, D, and E. Now people are going to travel on this route between these stations. So we're going to do the same thing on the other axis. A, B, C, D, E. Every point where these lines intersect represents a potential origin destination pair. You can travel from A to C, okay, there's a node. You can travel from D to E, uh, wherever that crosses and so on. You get the idea? Yeah. And, the, and the only thing you can't do is travel from any one place to the same place. That's a static equipment display. That's not a train. That's the difference between ridership and passenger miles, by the way. If you have a static equipment display and sell tickets to it, you're going to get ridership and revenue, but you don't care anybody anymore. So there's no passenger miles. No so there's a null set in the middle. Nobody goes from A to A. So this, this group of, of nodes doesn't exist. And if it does, if you're going to go from A to A in a round trip, that's two one-way trips. Everybody with me on this? Yeah. Okay. So what's the math of the network? The math of the network is the number of OD pairs in the network. We'll use the letter N, just the mathematical expression for number. In this case, it's 5 times 5, right? You go from anywhere to anywhere except to the same place, less n, which is 5. So the, the theoretical output of this, remember, OG pairs is a proxy for output. And you say, well, one's Chicago and one's Columbus, the average of all out, and they're all the same. It's, this, is, this is the number in this system that I've drawn is 5. So it's n times n minus n. Everybody got that? Uh, even I can figure out that now. That's n squared minus n. So the theoretical output of any network is the number of usable OD pairs squared minus n. So when you think of any network, what drives it is this squaring function. That's what drives exponential growth. Because if I'm a planner and this is my route, and somebody says, well, why don't you extend the route and add station F, the sixth one in the, in the route system, the effect on output is not merely additive. We're not adding one. We change N from 5 to 6. And what's N squared? What's 5 times 5 minus 5? It's 20. Okay? So if you go to 6 times 6, minus 6, it's 30. I added one station. My theoretical output that just went up by 50%. I added one station. To the when you think back to the uh, national planning map that you saw that Amtrak's doing, they're doing a bunch of little five station routes around the country. What happens instead if you take two interregional routes which have what, 20, 25 stations, and interlink them. Now I've gone from 25 OD pairs to what? Even if you just add them together, it's 50, but it's 50 times 50 minus 50. So what's the output of that network? And that's what, that, if you're serious about spending capital to drive growth in rail usage, carrying more people to more places, and generating more annual passenger miles of output, you don't get there by doing these dinky little local routes here and there.
That's like doing the Janesville train all over again on a national scale. Additive expansion of a network drives exponential growth and output. And that happens. It's inherent. It's in the mathematics of it. It's not because it's not Andy likes these trains and they like those trains. It's, it's the math. It's the science behind it. So the, the, the way to maximize the RPMs per dollar spent, spend less, get more, not spend more, get less, is to extend and interconnect the existing interregional routes and within regions to build smaller regional networks. I am much more interested in building networks even at a regional scale than in starting up little isolated point-to-point -point routes. I don't think of Chicago, Detroit as a viable market. Chicago, Detroit as an arm in a regional network, okay, now we're talking about something. Extending and interconnecting the existing interregional routes is also the lowest cost way to drive growth in the system because you don't need to build costly railroad infrastructure. You can do it within the constraints of existing rail capacity and what the host railroads are willing to put up with. And that's true both in absolute terms and in terms of cost per available seat mile. Let me bring this back to earth and give you four specific examples of the kind of growth that if I were running Amtrak, this is what I'd be looking to do, not starting up Louisville to Nashville. One example, <clears throat> picture, uh, if you will, the map and the routes of the Adirondack and the Maple Leaf trains. Two trains leave New York City every morning. I think it's still an hour apart. Uh, the only synergism between the two of them is that they run duplicate uh, frequencies up the Hudson River Valley to Albany and Schenectady. And then the Adirondack goes north to Montreal, uh, the Maple Leaf goes west and then hooks back around to Toronto. Two trains, no synergism, no network, no nothing, just point to point. And they get what they get. What if instead <clears throat> you took one of the trains, I don't think it matters which one, if I had to pick, I'd pick the Adirondack, but I don't care, and start it not in New York City, start it in Boston. Boston is about the same distance from Albany as New York City is. It's a little bit slower railroad, it's, it's a little bit, little bit farther distance, but it's not, that, it's not that much different. And bring them together at Albany Rensselaer, and guarantee a cross-platform connection there. So that to get from Springfield to Buffalo, I go to Albany, I walk 10 feet across the platform, I get on the other train, and off we go. And you schedule that dwell for maybe 40 minutes to give trains time to get there in case there's a, a, a screw up in the operation. And you open up a new market, certainly from Boston and Springfield up to Montreal, Historically, that was a good rail market. It doesn't exist today. But suddenly, <clears throat> at almost no incremental cost, you can get from anywhere east or south of Albany to anywhere west or north of Albany. That's a regional network. I haven't run the numbers on that, but you think about the squaring function, uh, in terms of return on investment, new incremental annual passenger miles per dollar spent, well, when the per dollar spent part of it is close to zero, you're ahead just by turning that on. Okay? That's a regional network out of two point-to-point -point trains. Here's another example. In the, in the national system and in the Midwest region, this would be my number one priority and it comes from an understanding of how networks function. I would take one of the Missouri River runners, picture it westbound out of St. Louis, and I wouldn't start it in St. Louis, I'd start it in Chicago like they used to do. Chicago, St. Louis, Kansas City, I'm gonna go, what, whatever the distance is, it's less than 200 miles, up to Omaha. So every day, one train, Chicago, St. Louis, Kansas City, Omaha. 
I don't care if anybody ever rides that train locally between Kansas City and Omaha. The reason you extend a train like that to Omaha is so that everybody from south of Chicago, from Springfield, St. Louis, Jeff City, and Omaha, can feed into the Central Transcontinental Corridor. And I can take those people to Denver and Salt Lake City and Northern California. I don't need very many of them to make it pay. If people want to ride locally, God bless them, I'll sell them a ticket, but that's not the reason you do that. You do that to create a bigger national network. The incremental cost of doing that is whatever the cost is of running a train on existing mainline railroad 200 miles a day to Omaha. It's a cost, but it's not a very big one. And the yield is great. The ROI on that would be stupendous. Incremental annual passenger miles per dollar invested. Here's another one. Same idea, larger scale. I would aggressively pursue running a train once a day through from St. Paul to Kansas City to Newton to Dallas. I'm sort of reinventing the Texas Chief, but I'm really sort of reinventing the Rock Islands Plainsman. That's really the model for this. St. Paul to Des Moines to Kansas City to Newton, Wichita, Oklahoma City, Fort Worth. Why they stop in Fort Worth bewilders me. Go across to Dallas, because that's where the people are trying to get to. What does that do for you? Again, yeah, I'm a lot less interested in selling tickets locally from Northfield, Minnesota to Mason City. I don't care about that. Somebody wants to give me money to do that, fine. What I'm really trying to do is what I just described to you interconnects all four, actually five if you think of it that way, all five western transcontinental routes. I can get from the Empire Builder route through a connection, not real easy to do, but it can, can be done in uh, South Central Iowa to the Cal Zephyr route. At Kansas City, I connect to the Southwest Chief. And down in Texas, I'm gonna connect uh, to the Eagle to the Sunset Limited route. And if you run that train, just think about this, if that train leaves St. Paul every morning at, let's say 10 o'clock, comfortably after the Empire Builder gets in, or is supposed to get in, uh, it interconnects naturally with all of the other routes in southern Iowa, near Osceola, in Kansas City, and in Texas. You take all the connecting pressure, all the misconnects off of Chicago, you create new markets at the cost of that one regional train. That's not a trivial cost, but the benefits are huge by interconnecting all the long distance routes. Um, and you think, well, you know, that's kind of how would people do that? Back in the day when Amtrak's schedules allowed the Empire Builder number eight to connect in Chicago, we sold tickets in St. Paul to, to people to ride from the Twin Cities to Denver and from the Twin Cities to Albuquerque and Southern California using same day connections in Chicago. Okay, you can't do that today for whatever reason, but you can with the regional train running on the spine line. Return on investment, incremental an annual passenger miles per dollar spent. Last example, route extension. Do you know how many annual visitors travel to Florida from Canada each year? Any guesses? Clark, what's your guess? Clark guesses 100,000. What am I bid? Several hundred thousand. You got, you're, you're not in the ballpark yet. It, it, before COVID, this apart from COVID, it was four and a half million people a year. Florida's full of Canadians in the wintertime. What's Amtrak's share of that market? Zero. Why? Because they're too lazy to run a train from Canada to Florida. What I would do, and I would, I would order this done next week, is extend the Silver Star, not the Meteor, the Star, because the Star goes to Tampa, remember, and most of the Canadians go to the West Coast, extend the Star to Canada. How do you do that? You run it through New York. Okay, you got to reverse in New York. We can live with that. We can figure that out. 
<clears throat> up to Albany, split it in half in Albany, just like the Lakeshore, just like the Empire Builder, just like the uh, Eagle, split it in half in Albany and send half of it overnight to, to Montreal and half of it overnight to Toronto. So now you got a two-night Eastern trip, just like all the Western trains. That's, this is not rocket science. I'm not going to get it all. I'm not going to get 5% of it, but I'll get some of it. And it's, what I, whatever we get is a lot more than they're getting now, which is zero. And you can build that out. It won't take long until in the winter season, you're not running a half a train to Toronto. You're going to be running a whole train to Toronto and a whole train to Montreal, and you're not going to be splitting them. You're going to be running them through, and we've reinvented the Orange Blossom Special. But it's now the Canadian Orange Blossom Special. Okay? And that's all on existing railroad infrastructure. You don't have to build a darn thing. You might have to hire more reservation clerks and put more people in the dining cars. There's probably a million just in Detroit before it. You know, Detroit to Florida is, it, 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 yes. I mean, obviously that's true. You could connect Detroit to Florida just by restoring a connecting train out of Detroit that would tie onto the Capital Limited someplace. Boom, done. Two nights, you're there. And, you know, people say, oh, I'm not going to ride two nights to Florida. Well, people ride two-night trips in the West all the time. That's the biggest business Amtrak has. That's the biggest piece of the biggest segment is the two-night trips in the West. You know what the average length of sleeping car trips is on the Empire Builder? It's over 1,200 miles, and that's the average. That tells you that a whole bunch of them are a whole lot longer than that. People do that, and they're filling the train up. You know, the marketers say, oh, you got to do studies. And you, gotta do... you know, you can black box these things sometimes. When, you, when you're doing something and it's wildly successful, let's do more of it. I mean, you, don't, you don't need studies and consultants to in figure the, all that in out. In the early 1980s, uh, my other organization, United uh, Rail Passenger Alliance, did a, a study. <clears throat> and at that time, we had access to a friendly source to a lot of inside data. And we picked a route, uh, in particular the Southwest Chief route. And we got the on and off data for a year, the actual numbers of people who got on and off the chief at each stop on the road. Real number, actual performance, no theory, no, no made up stuff. And one of my colleagues who was a PhD mathematician, I couldn't do this to save my life, set up a, a, a model using the University of California mainframe computer to do it. Uh, and he built a gravity model of the Southwest Chief Route using a bunch of assumptions about uh, at any given stop, given the population and the, and the distances from the station and how big a radius you could draw and what time of day the train called there and all, all those variables. He built a gravity model and then he kept tweaking it and testing it and tweaking it and testing it until the model predicted the actual number of on and offs. We took that as our validation point because the model was now producing the actual results that the train was getting. And at this time, uh, the Southwest Chief, on average over the course of a year, east of Flagstaff, had 212 passengers on board. And we asked the model, we then tasked the model to predict onboard ridership at the same point, if we did three things to the Southwest Chiefs route, these are all network builders. Thing one, at Kansas City eastward, we split the train into two sections. The main section did what it, what it does today to Chicago through Fort Madison. But the section that we split off through sleeper, through coaches, and some kind of food service car went Kansas City, St. Louis, Chicago. Not that anybody's going to, if you're, if you're going to Chicago, you're going to do it on the main train. But if not if you're going to Jefferson City, St. Louis, which has a few people in it, we travel to California and downstate Illinois. So we're going to serve them directly with through car service. That's thing one. Thing two, we're going to split off some cars 
through coach, through sleeper, and a, and a lounge car at Flagstaff westbound to go down the old Santa Fe line to Phoenix and Tucson. You don't go to Phoenix and stop, you go to Tucson. And thing three, thing three was westbound at Barstow. We'd split the train more or less in half, half to LA on its current route. The other half reinvent the San Francisco chief, send it over to Hatchapi and up the valley, displacing a local valley train. So there's no new train miles there. The only new train miles there is the Barstow to Bakersfield segment. Yes, you have to have the argument with the railroad about putting one more train. But since it's overnight, you're not too worried about speeds. So you can fit into the flow of traffic there, which it has to be. Okay, so now we've got these three things that we've done. We built a big scoop in the west, a pretty big scoop in the east, and we dropped that segment down to Phoenix and Tucson. So you can get from the upper Midwest to Phoenix and Tucson a whole day faster than you could on the uh, Eagle Sunset. Push the button on, on the model of the computer, and the computer said, if you do that, and if you make no other changes in the train operations, you don't do a better service, you don't do fancier upholstery, you don't do better food in the dining car, everything's the same. You're just doing it in these additional network segments. The computer predicted, using that calibrated model, that your average onboard count east of Flagstaff in both directions would be about 1,300 people today. That's a 600% increase with three relatively little tweaks. Network building, building up your number of OMD pairs available in that one route. 600% and we spent a little bit of money to do it. But right away, you, know, you look at a number like that and you think that's pretty conservative because we assume you don't do anything better, you just do it more places. And right away, your first, my first thought was you can't get 1,300 people onto a superliner train to be a mile long. Maybe this is precision scheduled passenger railroad. So right away, you, you think, okay, I need at least two and probably three trains to, to carry that many people, but that breaks the model assumption that you're not doing anything different or better. You're just doing it in more places. Because with three frequencies on that route, what happens to ridership? It goes up, right? If I can get on a train in Newton uh, at, at two in the afternoon instead of two in the morning, I'm more likely to, to choose, choose rail is my mode. So right away, you've got a big problem that you're, you're, you're creating growth that feeds on itself. And growth begets growth. This is not a if you build it, they will come kind of maybe what if dream scenario. This is using actual numbers calibrated to actual performance. And then, and then my colleague, who is the PhD mathematician, ran the same model connecting the Southwest Transcontinental Corridor to the Central Transcontinental Corridor, doing two little things. One little thing was Kansas City, Omaha. The other little thing was a connecting train. You know, the Santa Fe used to do this. This is not genius on our part. Run a connecting train from La Junta to Denver to Cheyenne. Do people travel from Texas to Colorado? Not on Amtrak, they don't, unless, unless you want to train for them. And I don't even remember what the numbers were that came out of that model, but they were so staggeringly large that, that we decided not to publish it because it would, we thought it would undermine the credibility of what we were arguing about network synergies. So when we come back to that basic question, how do you drive growth that maximizes return on investment? You interconnect and extend the existing network of inter-regional services. And yes, you build little spurs feeding that network. The little spurs feeding the network also, it just falls out as a consequence, not a reason, the local markets in those short quarters. 
If somebody wants to buy a ticket to ride from La Junta to Colorado Springs, God bless them, we'll sell them the ticket, but that's not why we're doing it. In Minnesota, we're evolving a concept. Dan's not up to speed on this yet, but he will be, because he's a bright guy. He'll, he'll get this when he sees it. We've got uh, one short, just this is the Minnesota intrastate where we can do this same thing on a regional basis. We've got North Star running about 40 miles out to a cornfield where there's a big parking lot. Uh, NLX is, is next down the pipe. Uh, the Eau Claire to St. Paul, please. How about Minneapolis? Why are we going to St. Paul? That's not the center of gravity of the commercial environment of the Twin Cities. It's nine miles west in Minneapolis. What's the problem there? You gotta get through the Midway District, which is a railroad choke point. Okay, so we've got to put in maybe three miles, maybe nine miles of an additional main track that will serve all the corridors in Minnesota. Dan yeah, knows that, but he doesn't like to deal with it because it's expensive. Eau Claire, uh, the next, the highest priority corridor of the Minnesota State Rail Plan is the Southern Minnesota Corridor, which goes from uh, St. Paul Union Depot uh, south on the Rock Island Spine Line to Northfield, Oatana, and Albert Lee. And at Oatana, it hubs, networking again, it hubs with the east-west line, which will run maybe three DMU trains a day, Winona, Rochester, Oatana, Mankato. Okay, building little regional networks. We've got the second train to Chicago. You know, I, I wish it well. Not real optimistic about it. When the Empire Builder runs truncated just to St. Paul, trains 807, 808. You guys know what kind of load factors they have on that? They'll run two or three coaches in a launch car on the builder's schedule, but, it, but it's a null west of St. Paul. You know how many people ride that? They're on a good day, they'll get 100 people on the whole trip. Market, I'm sorry, the local market is not strong. We put on a second frequency, maybe it'll get stronger. I'm not wishing it ill, but I'm saying that's not that's not where I would start. Maybe that's the path of least resistance growth. And if it is, so be it. Let's let's look forward to the day when we're having to sell seats on that train. Okay, but in Minnesota, my point is we're building these these uh, spokes, and the breakthrough idea. This is not genius. This is kind of falling off the log. Obvious is. Let them be developed separately. I don't want to tell Duluth what they want to do on their, on their spoke, but I do want to have a conversation with Duluth about saying, let's, let's figure out that we're building spokes on the same wheel, arms on the same body, so that maybe your trains run through to Oatana. Maybe North Star trains run through to Eau Claire. And everything hubs at St. Paul Union Depot. So you can get from anywhere in that network to anywhere in the network. Then you've got a network on a regional basis and our ROI will be far beyond what we get running discontiguous networks where this train stops in Minneapolis, that train stops in St. Paul and can't get from here to go. I'm done. Uh, John, can we, do we have a minute for questions? Anybody, anybody, anybody want to argue with you? I want to know my the question is, how can you talk Amtrak into something like this? And the answer is you can't. And the reason is the people who own Amtrak, which is the block of members of Congress from the Northeastern states, don't want to do it. They don't care about ROI. That's an example of growth through sheer political power. And that's, that's just the way it is. It's not moral or immoral. It just wastes money. Because if you spent the money some in a different way, you get far more for it. Right. Well, you need to ask yourselves right. this right. question. To, to build those trains, those why, trains. why is it that the state of Wisconsin and Minnesota, my state too, why is it that the states are single sourcing the contract of this scale without competitive bidding? Is That's there right. is is there any is there any road project on this scale that Wisconsin builds without competitive bidding? 
Amtrak is not a monopoly, legally or practically. And if CP's answer is, well, we don't want strangers running trains on our railroad, the answer is, okay, we'll pay you. You drive it. My train, I own the inside of it, and I'll hire your guy to drive it. Cut out, cut out the middleman all the day. That's how North Star runs in Minnesota. That council pays BNSF to staff the engineer and conductor on that train. Oh, plenty of other, plenty of so, services. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's places, you know, Herzog has the ACE contract. Uh, is it Veolia has the, the Boston contract? You can have a third party do it where the railroad's willing to put up with it. BNSF is on record with the Heartland Flyer saying, we don't want anybody but Amtrak running trains in our life. My answer is fine, we'll pay you. Cut out the middle bit. I own the train, you drive it, that's fine. And then, and then you start to see competition, innovation, and lower costs. Nobody knows what the second train to Chicago really costs. Because Amtrak makes up their numbers. They do, they make them up. And if, if the state pushes back hard enough, they mysteriously come down. If, if you want to if you want to find out just how bad it is when you rely on a sole source contract you can find this online very easily read stacy mortensen's testimony to congress from two years three years ago about her experience with the jpa in northern cal that has amtrak running the san joaquin's and also has herzog running the ace trains night and day different Read Stacy's description of that. It's an eye opener. Thank you very much.